Reverend Sir, yours I received the other day, and I am very ready to serve you to my utmost. I should be very loath to bring myself into any snare by my freedom with you, and therefore hope that you will put the best construction on what I write, and secure me from such as would interpret my lines otherwise than they are designed. Obedience to lawful authority I evermore accounted a great duty, and willingly I would not practice anything that might thwart and contradict such a principle. Too many are ready to despise dominions and speak evil of dignities, and I am sure the mischiefs which arise from a factious and rebellious spirit are very sad and notorious, insomuch that I would sooner bite my finger's ends than willingly cast dirt on authority or any way offer reproach to it. Far, therefore, be it for me to have anything to do with those men your letter mentions, whom you acknowledge to be men of a factious spirit, and never more in their element than when they are declaiming against men in public place and contriving methods attend to the disturbance of the common peace. I never accounted it a credit to my cause to have the good liking of such men. My son, says Solomon, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Proverb 24, 21. However, sir, I never thought judges infallible, but reckoned that they, as well as private men, might err, and that when they were guilty of erring, standers by who possibly had not half their judgment might, notwithstanding, be able to detect and behold their errors. And furthermore, when errors of that nature are thus detected and observed, I never thought it an in interfering with dutifulness and subjection for one man to communicate his thoughts to another thereabout, and with modesty and due reverence to debate the premised failings, at least when errors are fundamental and probably pervert the great end of authority and government. For as to circumstantial errors, I must confess my principle is that it is the duty of a good subject to cover with his silence a multitude of them. But I shall no longer detain you with my preface, but pass to some things you look for. And whether you expect such freedom from me, yea or nay, yet shall you find that I am very open to communicate my thoughts unto you, and in plain terms to tell you what my opinion is of the Salem proceedings. First, as to the method which the Salem justices do take in their examinations, it is truly this. A warrant being issued out to apprehend the persons that are charged and complained of by the afflicted children, as they are called. Said persons are brought before the justices, the afflicted being present. The justices ask the apprehended why they afflict those poor children, to which the apprehended answer, they do not afflict them. The justices order the apprehended to look upon the said children, which accordingly they do. And at the time of that look, I dare not say by that look, as the Salem gentlemen do, the afflicted are cast into a fit. The apprehended are then blinded in order to touch the afflicted. And at that touch, though not by the touch, as above, the afflicted ordinarily do come out of their fits. The afflicted persons then declare and affirm that the apprehended have afflicted them upon which the apprehended persons, though of never so good repute, are forthwith committed to prison on suspicion for witchcraft. One of the Salem justices was pleased to tell Mr. Alden, when upon his examination, that truly he had been acquainted with him these many years, and had always accounted him a good man. But indeed, now he should be obliged to change his opinion. This, there are more than one or two did hear, and are ready to swear to, if not in so many words, yet as to its natural and plain meaning. He saw reason to change his opinion of Mr. Alden because that at the time he touched the poor child, the poor child came out of her fit. I suppose his honor never made the experiment, whether there was not as much virtue in his own hand as there was in Mr. Alden's to cure by a touch. I know a man that will venture two to one with any Salemite whatever that let the matter be duly managed and the afflicted person shall come out of her fit upon the touch of the most religious hand in Salem. It is worthily noted by some that at some times the afflicted will not presently come out of their fits upon the touch of the suspected, and then, forsooth, they are ordered by the justices to grasp hard, harder yet, etc., insomuch that at length the afflicted come out of their fits. And the reason is very good, because that at a touch of any hand, and possessive time will work the cure. Infallibly they will do it, as experience teaches. 
I cannot but condemn this method of the justices, of making this touch of the hand a rule to discover witchcraft, because I am fully persuaded that it is sorcery and a superstitious method, and that which we have no rule for, either from reason or religion. The Salem justices, at least some of them, do assert that the cure of the afflicted persons is a natural effect of this touch, and they are so well instructed in their Cartesian philosophy and in the doctrine of effluvia that they undertake to give a demonstration how this touch does cure the afflicted persons. And the account they give of it is this, that by this touch the venomous and malignant particles that were ejected from the eye do, by this means, return to the body whence they came, and so leave the afflicted persons pure and whole. I must confess to you that I am no small admirer of the Cartesian philosophy, but yet I have not so learned it. Certainly, this is a strain that it will by no means allow of. I would fain know of these Salem gentlemen, but as yet could never know, how it comes about that if these apprehended persons are witches, and by look of the eye do cast the afflicted into their fits by poisoning them, how it comes about, I say, that by a look of their eye they do not cast others into fits, and poison others by their looks, and in particular tender, fearful women who often are beheld by them, and as likely as any in the whole world to receive an ill impression from them. This Salem philosophy some men may call the new philosophy, but I think it rather deserves the name of Salem superstition and sorcery, and it is not fit to be named in a land of such light as New England is. I think the matter might be solved another way, but I shall not make any attempt that way, further than to say that these afflicted children, as they are called, do hold correspondence with the devil, even in the esteem and account of the Salem gentlemen. For when the black man, i.e., say these gentlemen, the devil, does appear to them, they ask him many questions, and accordingly give information to the inquirer. And if this is not holding correspondence with the devil, and something worse, I know not what is. But furthermore, I would fain know of these Salem justices what need there is of further proof and evidence to convict and condemn these apprehended persons than this look and touch, if so be they are so certain that this falling down and arising up when there is a look and a touch, are natural effects of the said look and touch, and so a perfect demonstration and proof of witchcraft in those persons. What can the jury or judges desire more to convict any man of witchcraft than a plain demonstration that the said man is a witch? Now if this look and touch, circumstanced as before, be a plain demonstration, as their philosophy teaches, what need they seek for further evidences when, after all, it can be but a demonstration? But let this pass with the Salem gentlemen, for never so plain and natural a demonstration, yet certain is it that the reasonable part of the world, when acquainted herewith, will laugh at the demonstration, and conclude that the said Salem gentlemen are actually possessed, at least, with ignorance and folly. I most admire that Mr. Nicholas Noyes, the reverend teacher at Salem, who is educated at the School of Knowledge, and is certainly a learned, a charitable, and a good man, though all the devils in hell and all the possessed girls in Salem should say to the contrary. At him, I say, I do most admire, that he should cry up the above-mentioned philosophy after the manner that he does. I can assure you that I can bring you more than two, or twice two, very credible persons that will affirm that they have heard him vindicate the above-mentioned demonstration as very reasonable. Secondly, with respect to the confessors, as they are improperly called, or such as confess themselves to be witches, the second thing you inquire into your letter, there are now about 50 of them in prison, many of which I have again and again seen and heard, and I cannot but tell you that my faith is strong concerning them, that they are deluded, imposed upon, and under the influence of some evil spirit, and therefore unfit to be evidences either against themselves or anyone else. I now speak of one sort of them, and of others afterward. These confessors, as they are called, do very often contradict themselves, as inconsistently as is usual for any crazed, distempered person to do. This the Salem gentlemen do see and take notice of, and even the judges themselves have, at some times, taken these confessors in flat lies or contradictions even in the courts, by reason of which one would have thought that the judges would have frowned upon the said confessors, discarded them, 
and not minded one tittle of anything that they said. But instead thereof, as sure as we are men, the judges vindicate these confessors and salve their contradictions by proclaiming that the devil takes away their memory and imposes upon their brain. If this reflects anywhere, I am very sorry for it. I can but assure you that, upon the word of an honest man, it is truth, and that I can bring you many credible persons to witness it, who have been eye and ear witnesses to these things. These confessors, then, at least some of them, even in the judge's own account, are under the influence of the devil. And the brain of these confessors is imposed upon by the devil, even in the judge's account. But now, if, in the judge's account, these confessors are under the influence of the devil, and their brains are affected and imposed upon by the devil, so that they are not their own men, why then should these judges, or any other men, make such account of, and set so much by, the words of these confessors as they do? In short, I argue thus. If the devil does actually take away the memory of them at some times, certainly the devil, at other times, may very reasonably be thought to affect their fancies, and to represent false ideas to their imagination. But now, if it be thus granted that the devil is able to represent false ideas, to speak vulgarly, to the imagination of the confessors, what man of sense will regard the confessions, or any of the words, of these confessors? The great cry of many of our neighbors now is, What? Will you not believe the confessors? Will you not believe men and women who confess that they have signed to the devil's book, that they were baptized by the devil, and that they were at the mock sacrament once and again? What? Will you not believe that this is witchcraft, and that such and such men are witches, although the confessors do own and assert it? Thus, I say, many of our good neighbors do argue, but methinks they might soon be convinced that there is nothing at all in all these their arguings if they would but duly consider of the premises. In the meantime, I think we must rest satisfied in it, and be thankful to God for it, that all men are not thus bereft of their senses, but that we have here and there considerate and thinking men, who will not thus be imposed upon and abused by the subtle endeavors of the crafty one. In the next place, I proceed to the form of their indictments, and the trials thereupon. The indictments run for sorcery and witchcraft, acted upon the body of such as one, say, Mary Warren, at such a particular time, say, April 14, 1692, and at divers other times before and after, whereby the said Mary Warren is wasted and consumed, pined, etc. Now for the proof of the said sorcery and witchcraft, the prisoner at the bar pleading not guilty. 1. The afflicted persons are brought into court and after much patience and pains taken with them, do take their oaths, that the prisoner at the bar did afflict them. And here I think it very observable, that often, when the afflicted do mean and intend only the appearance and shape of such a one, say, G. Proctor, yet they positively swear that G. Proctor did afflict them, and they have been allowed so to do, as though there was no real difference between G. Proctor and the shape of G. Proctor. This, methinks, may readily prove a stumbling block to the jury, lead them into a very fundamental error, and occasion innocent blood, yea, the innocent blood imaginable, to be in great danger. Whom it belongs unto, to be eyes unto the blind, and to remove such stumbling blocks, I know full well, and yet you, and everyone else, do know as well as I who do not. 2. The confessors do declare what they know of the said prisoner, and some of the confessors are allowed to give their oaths, a thing which I believe was never heard of in this world, that such as confess themselves to be witches, to have renounced God and Christ and all that is sacred, should yet be allowed and ordered to swear by the name of the great God. This indeed seemeth to me to be a gross taking of God's name in vain. I know the Salem gentlemen do say that there is hopes that these said confessors have repented. I shall only say that if they have repented, it is well for themselves. But if they have not, it is very ill for you know who. But then, three, whoever can be in evidence against the prisoner at the bar is ordered to come into court. And here it scarce ever fails, but that evidences of one nature and another are brought in, though I think all of them altogether alien to the matter of indictment. For they none of them do respect witchcraft upon the bodies of the afflicted which is the alone matter of charge in the indictment. 
Four, they are searched by a jury. And as to some of them, the jury brought in that on such or such a place, there was a preternatural excrescence. And I wonder what person there is, whether man or woman, of whom it cannot be said, but that in some part of their body or other, there is a preternatural excrescence. The term is a very general and inclusive term. Some of the Salem gentlemen are very forward to censure and condemn the poor prisoner at the bar because he sheds no tears. But such betray great ignorance in the nature of passion, and as great heedlessness as to common passages of a man's life. Some there are who never shed tears. Others there are that ordinarily shed tears upon light occasions, and yet for their lives cannot shed a tear when the deepest sorrow is upon their hearts. And who is there that knows not these things? Who knows not that an ecstasy of joy will sometimes fetch tears, when as the quite contrary passion will shut them close up? Why then should any be so silly and foolish as to take an argument from this appearance? But this is by the by. In short, the prisoner at the bar is indicted for sorcery and witchcraft acted upon the bodies of the afflicted. Now, for the proof of this, I reckon that the only pertinent evidences brought in are the evidences of the said afflicted. It is true that over and above the evidences of the afflicted persons, there are many evidences brought in against the prisoner at the bar, either that he was at a witch meeting, or that he performed things which could not be done by an ordinary natural power, or that she sold butter to a sailor, which, proving bad at sea, and the seamen exclaiming against her, she appeared, and soon after there was a storm, or the like. But what if there were 10,000 evidences of this nature? How do they prove the matter of indictment? And if they do not reach the matter of indictment, then I think it is clear that the prisoner at the bar is brought in guilty and condemned merely from the evidences of the afflicted persons. The Salem gentlemen will by no means allow that any are brought in guilty and condemned by virtue of specter evidence, as it is called, i.e. the evidence of these afflicted persons who are said to have spectral eyes. But whether it is not purely by virtue of these specter evidences that these persons are found guilty, considering what before has been said, I leave you and any man of sense to judge and determine. When any man is indicted for murdering the person of A.B., and all the direct evidence be that the said man pistoled the shadow of the said A.B., though there be never so many evidences that the said person murdered C, D, E, F, and ten more persons, yet all this will not amount to a legal proof that he murdered A.B., and upon the indictment, the person cannot be legally brought in guilty of the said indictment, it must be upon this supposition that the evidence of a man's pistoling the shadow of AB is a legal evidence to prove that the said man did murder the person of AB. Now no man will be so much out of his wits as to make this a legal evidence, and yet this seems to be our case, and how to apply it is very easy and obvious. As to the late executions, I shall only tell you that in the opinion of many unprejudiced, considerate, and considerable spectators, some of the condemned went out of the world not only with as great protestations, but also with as good shows of innocency as men could do. They protested their innocency as in the presence of the great God, whom forthwith they were to appear before. They wished, and declared their wish, that their blood might be the last innocent blood shed upon that account. With great affection, they entreated Mr. Cotton Mather to pray with them. They prayed that God would discover what witchcrafts were among us. They forgave their accusers. They spoke without reflection on jury and judges for bringing them in guilty and condemning them. They prayed earnestly for pardon for all other sins and for an interest in the precious blood of our dear Redeemer, and seemed to be very sincere, upright, and sensible of their circumstances on all accounts especially Proctor and Willard, whose whole management of themselves, from the jail to the gallows, and whilst at the gallows, was very affecting and melting to the hearts of some considerable spectators, whom I could mention to you, but they are executed, and so I leave them. Many things I cannot but admire and wonder at, an account of which I shall here send you. And one, I do admire that some particular persons, and particularly Mrs. Thatcher of Boston, should be much complained of by the afflicted persons, and yet that the justices should never issue out their warrants to apprehend them, 
when as upon the same account, they issue out their warrants for the apprehending and imprisoning many others. This occasions much discourse and many hot words, and is a very great scandal and stumbling block to many good people. Certainly, distributive justice should have its course without respect to persons, and although the said Mrs. Thatcher be mother-in-law to Mr. Corwin, who is one of the justices and judges, yet if justice and conscience do oblige them to apprehend others on the account of the afflicted, their complaints, I cannot see how, without injustice and violence to conscience, Mrs. Thatcher can escape, when it is well known how much she is, and has been, complained of. 2. I cannot but admire that Mr. Hezekiah Usher, whom we all think innocent, should yet be apprehended on this account, in order to prison by a mitimus under Mr. Lynn's hand, and yet that he should be suffered, for above a fortnight, to be in a private house, and after that to quit the house, the town, and the province, and yet that authority should not take effectual notice of it. Methinks that same justice, that actually imprisoned others, and refused bail for them on any terms, should not be satisfied without actually imprisoning Mr. Usher, and refusing bail for him, when his case is known to be the very same with the case of those others. If he may be suffered to go away, why may not others? If others may not be suffered to go, how in justice can he be allowed herein? 3. If our justices do think that Mrs. Carey, Mr. English and his wife, Mr. Alden and others were capital offenders and justly imprisoned on a capital account, I do admire that the said justices should hear of their escape from prison, and where they are gone and entertained, and yet not send forthwith to the said places for the surrendering of them, that justice might be done them. In other capitals this has been practiced. Why then is it not practiced in this case, if really judged to be so heinous as is made for? 4. I cannot but admire that any should go with their distempered friends and relations to the afflicted children, to know what their distempered friends ail, whether they are not bewitched, who it is that afflicts them, and the like. It is true, I know no reason why these afflicted may not be consulted as well as any other, if so be that it was only their natural and ordinary knowledge that was had recourse to. But it is not on this notion that these afflicted children are sought on to, but as they have a supernatural knowledge, a knowledge which they obtain by their holding correspondence with specters or evil spirits as they themselves grant. This consulting of these afflicted children, as above said, seems to me to be a very gross evil, a real abomination not fit to be known in New England, and yet is a thing practiced not only by Tom and John, I mean the ruder and more ignorant sort, but by many who profess high and pass among us for some of the better sort. This is that which aggravates the evil and makes it heinous and tremendous, and yet this is not the worst of it, for, as sure as I now write to you, even some of our civil leaders and spiritual teachers who, I think, should punish and preach down such sorcery and wickedness, do yet allow of, encourage, yea, and practice this very abomination. I know there are several worthy gentlemen in Salem who account this practice as an abomination, have trembled to see the methods of this nature which others have used, and have declared themselves to think the practice to be very evil and corrupt, but all avails little with the abutters of the said practice. A person from Boston, of no small note, carried up his child to Salem, near twenty miles, on purpose that he might consult the afflicted about his child, which accordingly he did. And the afflicted told him that his child was afflicted by Mrs. Carey and Mrs. Obinson. The man returned to Boston, and went forthwith to the justices for a warrant to seize the said Obinson, the said Carey being out of the way. But the Boston justices saw reason to deny a warrant. The Reverend Mr. Increase Mather of Boston took occasion severely to reprove the said man, asking him whether there was not a god in Boston, that he should go to the devil in Salem for advice warning him very seriously against such naughty practices, which, I hope, prove to the conviction and good of the said person. If not, his blood will be upon his own head. This consulting of these afflicted children about their sick was the unhappy beginning of the unhappy troubles at poor Andover. Horse and man were sent up to Salem Village from the said Andover for some of the said afflicted, and more than one or two of them were carried down to see Ballard's wife and to tell who it was that did afflict her. I understand that the said Ballard took advice before he took this method, 
But what pity was it that he should meet with and hearken to such bad counselors? Poor Andover does now rue the day that ever the said afflicted went among them. They lament their folly, and are an object of great pity and commiseration. Captain Ballard and Mr. Stevens are complained of by the afflicted, have left the town and do abscond. Deacon Fry's wife, Captain Osgood's wife, and some others, remarkably pious and good people in repute, are apprehended and imprisoned. And that that is more admirable, the forementioned women are become a kind of confessors, being first brought thereto by the urgings and arguings of their good husbands, who, having taken up that corrupt and highly pernicious opinion, that whoever were accused by the afflicted were guilty, did break charity with their dear wives upon their being accused, and urged them to confess their guilt, which so far prevailed with them as to make them say they were afraid of their being in the snare of the devil and which, through the rude and barbarous methods that were afterwards used at Salem, issued in somewhat plainer degrees of confession and was attended with imprisonment. The good deacon and captain are now sensible of the error they were in, do grieve and mourn bitterly that they should break their charity with their wives and urge them to confess themselves witches. They now see and acknowledge their rashness and uncharitableness, and are very fit objects for the pity and prayers of every good Christian. Now I am writing concerning Andover. I cannot omit the opportunity of sending you this information, that whereas there is a report spread abroad the country, how that they were much addicted to sorcery in the said town, and that there were forty men in it that could raise the devil as well as any astrologer and the like. After the best search that I can make into it, it proves a mere slander and a very unrighteous imputation. The reverend elders of the said place were much surprised upon their hearing of the said report and faithfully made inquiry about it. But the whole of naughtiness that they could discover and find out was only this, that two or three girls had foolishly made use of the sieve and scissors, as children have done in other towns. This method of the girls I do not justify in any measure, but yet I think it very hard and unreasonable that a town should lie under the blemish and scandal of sorceries and conjuration, merely for the inconsiderate practices of two or three girls in the said town. 5. I cannot but admire that the justices, whom I think to be well-meaning men, should so far give ear to the devil as merely upon his authority to issue out their warrants and apprehend people. Liberty was evermore accounted the great privilege of an Englishman, but certainly, if the devil will be heard against us and his testimony taken to the seizing and apprehending of us, our liberty vanishes, and we are fools if we boast of our liberty. Now, that the justices have thus far given ear to the devil, I think it may be mathematically demonstrated to any man of common sense and for the demonstration and proof hereof, I desire only that these two things may be duly considered, viz. 1. That several persons have been apprehended purely upon the complaints of these afflicted, to whom the afflicted were perfect strangers, and had not the least knowledge of imaginable before they were apprehended. 2. That the afflicted do own and assert, and the justices do grant that the devil does inform and tell the afflicted the names of those persons that are thus unknown unto them. Now, these two things being duly considered, I think it will appear evident to anyone that the devil's information is the fundamental testimony that has gone upon in the apprehending of the aforesaid people. If I believe such or such an assertion as comes immediately from the minister of God in the pulpit, because it is the word of the ever-living God, I build my faith on God's testimony. And if I practice upon it, this my practice is properly built on the word of God, even so in the case before us. If I believe the afflicted persons as informed by the devil, and act thereupon, this my act may properly be said to be grounded upon the testimony or information of the devil. And now, if things are thus, I think it ought to be for lamentation to you and me, and all such as would be accounted good Christians. If any should see the force of this argument, and upon it say, as I heard a wise and good judge once propose, that they know not but that God Almighty, or a good spirit, does give this information to these afflicted persons, I make answer thereto, and say that it is most certain that it is neither Almighty God nor yet any good spirit that gives this information. And my reason is good, because God is a God of truth, and the good spirits will not lie, whereas these misinformations have several times proved false, when the accused were brought before the afflicted. 6. I cannot but admire that these afflicted persons should be so much countenanced and encouraged in their accusations as they are. I often think of the Groton woman that was afflicted, an account of which we have in print, and is a most certain truth not to be doubted of. 
I shall only say that there was as much ground in the hour of it to countenance the said Groton woman, and to apprehend and imprison on her accusations as there is now to countenance these afflicted persons, and to apprehend and imprison on their accusations. 6. I cannot but admire that these afflicted persons should be so much countenanced and encouraged in their accusations as they are. I often think of the Groton woman that was afflicted, an account of which we have in print, and is a most certain truth and not to be doubted of. I shall only say that there was as much ground in the hour of it to countenance the said Groton woman, and to apprehend and imprison on her accusations, as there is now to countenance these afflicted persons, and to apprehend and imprison on their accusations. But furthermore, it is worthy of our deepest consideration that in the conclusion, after multitudes have been imprisoned and many have been put to death, these afflicted persons should own that all was a mere fancy and delusion of the devils, as the Groton woman did own and acknowledge with respect to herself. If, I say, in after times this be acknowledged by them, how can the justices, judges, or any else concerned in these matters look back upon these things without the greatest of sorrow and grief imaginable? I confess to you, it makes me tremble when I seriously consider of this thing. I have heard that the chief judge has expressed himself very hardly of the accused woman at Groton, as though he believed her to be a witch to this day. But by such as knew the said woman, this is judged a very uncharitable opinion of the said judge, and I do not understand that any are proselyted thereto. Reverend Sir, these things I cannot but admire and wonder at. Now, if so be it is the effect of my dullness that I thus admire, I hope you will pity, not censure me. But if, on the contrary, these things are just matter of admiration, I know that you will join with me in expressing your admiration hereat. The chief judge is very zealous in these proceedings, and says he is very clear as to all that hath yet been acted by this court, and as far as ever I could perceive is very impatient in hearing anything that looks another way. I very highly honor and reverence the wisdom and integrity of the said judge, and hope that this matter shall not diminish my veneration for his honor. However, I cannot but say my great fear is that wisdom and counsel are withheld from his honor as to this matter, which yet I look upon not so much as a judgment to his honor as to this poor land. But although the chief judge and some of the other judges be very zealous in these proceedings, yet this you may take for a truth that there are several about the bay, men for understanding, judgment, and piety, inferior to few, if any, in New England, that do utterly condemn the said proceedings, and do freely deliver their judgment in the case to be this, viz. that these methods will utterly ruin and undo poor New England. I shall nominate some of these to you, viz. the Honorable Simon Bradstreet Esquire, our late governor, the Honorable Thomas Danforth Esquire, our late Deputy Governor, the Reverend Mr. Increase Mather, and the Reverend Mr. Samuel Willard. Major Nathaniel Saltonstall Esquire, who was one of the judges, has left the court and is very much dissatisfied with the proceedings of it. Excepting Mr. Hale, Mr. Noyes, and Mr. Paris, the Reverend Elders almost throughout the whole country are very much dissatisfied. Several of the late justices viz. Thomas Graves, Esquire, N. Byfield, Esquire, Francis Foxcroft, Esquire, are much dissatisfied. Also several of the present justices, and in particular some of the Boston justices, were resolved rather to throw up their commissions than be active in disturbing the liberty of their majesty's subjects, merely on the accusations of these afflicted, possessed children. Finally, the principal gentlemen in Boston and thereabout are generally agreed that irregular and dangerous methods have been taken as to these matters. Sir, I would not willingly lead you into any error, and therefore would desire you to note, one, that when I called these afflicted, quote, the afflicted children, end quote, I would not be understood as though I meant that all that are afflicted are children. There are several young men and women that are afflicted, as well as children. But this term has most prevailed among us because of the younger sort that were first afflicted, and therefore I make use of it. 2. Then when I speak of the Salem gentlemen, I would not be understood as though I meant every individual gentleman in Salem, nor yet as though I meant that there were no men but in Salem that run upon these notions. Some term they must have, and this seems not improper, because in Salem this sort of gentleman does most abound. 3 that other justices in the country, besides the Salem justices, have issued out their warrants and imprisoned on the accusations of the afflicted as aforesaid, and therefore, when I speak of the Salem justices, I do not mean them exclusively. 4. 
that as to the above-mentioned judges that are commissionated for this court at Salem, five of them do belong to Suffolk County, four of which five do belong to Boston, and therefore I see no reason why Boston should talk of Salem as though their own judges had had no hand in these proceedings at Salem. Nineteen persons have now been executed, and one pressed to death for a mute. Seven more are condemned, two of which are reprieved because they pretend they're being with child. One, viz. Mrs. Bradbury of Salisbury, from the intercession of some friends. And two or three more because they are confessors. The court is adjourned to the first Tuesday in November, then to be kept at Salem. Between this and then will be the great assembly, and this matter will be a peculiar matter of their agitation. I think it is matter of earnest supplication and prayer to Almighty God that he would afford his gracious presence to the said assembly and direct them aright in this weighty matter. Our hopes are here, and if, at this juncture, God does not graciously appear for us, I think we may conclude that New England is undone and undone. I am very sensible that it is irksome and disagreeable to go back when a man's doing so is an implication that he has been walking in a wrong path. However, nothing is more honorable than, upon due conviction, to retract and undo, so far as may be, what has been amiss and irregular. I would hope that, in the conclusion, both the judges and justices will see and acknowledge that such were their best friends and advisers as dissuaded from the methods which they have taken, though hitherto too they have been angry with them and apt to speak very hardly of them. I cannot but highly applaud and think it our duty to be very thankful for the endeavors of several elders whose lips, I think, should preserve knowledge and whose counsel should, I think, have been more regarded in a case of this nature than as yet it has been. In particular, I cannot but think very honorably of the endeavors of a reverend person in Boston whose good affection to this country in general and spiritual relation to three of the judges in particular has made him very solicitous and industrious in this matter. And I am fully persuaded that had this notion and proposals been hearkened to and followed when these troubles were in their birth in an ordinary way, they would never have grown onto that height which now they have. He has yet met with little but unkindness, abuse, and reproach from many men, but I trust that, in after times, his wisdom and service will find a more universal acknowledgement, and if not, his reward is with the Lord. Two or three things I should have hinted to you before, but they slipped my thoughts in their proper place. Many of these afflicted persons, who have scores of strange fits in a day, yet in the intervals of time are hale and hearty, robust and lusty, as though nothing had afflicted them. I remember that when the chief judge gave the first jury their charge, he told them that they were not to mind whether the bodies of the said afflicted were really pined and consumed, as was expressed in the indictment, but whether the said afflicted did not suffer from the accused such afflictions as naturally tended to their being pined and consumed, wasted, etc. This, said he, is a pining and consuming in the sense of the law, I add not. Furthermore. These afflicted persons do say, and often have declared it, that they can see specters when their eyes are shut, as well as when they are open. This one thing I evermore accounted as very observable, and that which might serve as a good key to unlock the nature of these mysterious troubles, if duly improved by us. Can they see specters when their eyes are shut? I am sure they lie, at least speak falsely if they say so, for the thing in nature is an utter impossibility. It is true that may strongly fancy or have things represented to their imagination when their eyes are shut, and I think this is all which ought to be allowed to these blind, nonsensical girls. And if our officers and courts have apprehended, imprisoned, condemned, and executed our guiltless neighbors, certainly our error is great, and we shall rue it in the conclusion. There are two or three other things that I observed in and by these afflicted persons which make me strongly suspect that the devil imposes upon their brains and deludes their fancies and imagination, and that the devil's book, which they say they have been offered them, is a mere fancy of theirs and no reality, that the witches' meeting, the devil's baptism, and mock sacraments, which they oft speak of, are nothing else but the effect of their fancy, depraved and deluded by the devil, and not a reality to be regarded or minded by any wise man. And whereas the confessors have owned and asserted the said meetings, the said baptism and mock sacrament, which the Salem gentlemen and some others make much account of, I am very apt to think that, did you know the circumstances of the said confessors? You would not be swayed thereby any otherwise than to be confirmed that all is perfect devilism and an hellish design to ruin and destroy this poor land. 
For whereas there are the said confessors fifty-five in number, some of them are known to be distracted, crazed women, something of which you may see by a petition lately offered to the chief judge, a copy whereof I may now send you. Others of them denied their guilt and maintained their innocency for above eighteen hours after most violent, distracting, and dragooning methods had been used with them to make them confess. Such methods they were, that more than one of the said confessors did since tell many, with tears in their eyes, that they thought their very lives would have gone out of their bodies, and wished that they might have been cast into the lowest dungeon, rather than be tortured with such repeated buzzings and chuckings and unreasonable urgings as they were treated withal. They soon recanted their confessions, acknowledging, with sorrow and grief, that it was an hour of great temptation with them. And I am very apt to think that as for five or six of the said confessors, if they are not very good Christian women, it will be no easy matter to find so many good Christian women in New England. But finally, as to about thirty of these fifty-five confessors, they are possessed, I reckon, with the devil, and afflicted as the children are, and therefore not fit to be regarded as to anything they say of themselves or others. And whereas the Salem gentlemen do say that these confessors made their confessions before they were afflicted, it is absolutely contrary to universal experience as far as ever I could understand. It is true that some of these have made their confession before they had their falling, tumbling fits, but yet not absolutely before they had any fits and marks of possession. For, as the Salem gentlemen know full well, when these persons were about first confessing, their mouths would be stopped, and their throats affected as though there was danger of strangling, and afterward, it is true, came their tumbling fits. So that, I say, the confessions of these persons were in the beginning of their fits, and not truly before their fits, as the Salem gentlemen would make us believe. Thus, sir... I have given you as full a narrative of these matters as readily occurs to my mind, and I think every word of it is matter of fact. The several glosses and dissents whereupon, by way of reasoning, I refer to your judgment, whether to approve or disapprove. What will be the issue of these troubles, God only knows. I am afraid that ages will not wear off that reproach and those stains which these things will leave behind them upon our land. I pray God pity us, humble us, forgive us, and appear mercifully for us in this our mount of distress. Herewith I conclude and subscribe myself, Reverend Sir, your real friend and humble servant, Thomas Brattle.